At the age of 72, Evelyn Nesbitt was working as an advisor on a film about her life. The movie, The Girl in the Red Velvet Swing, was about the love affair between two men and a young Evelyn, but it did not show most of the story. The film did not portray the manipulation and the assaults that Evelyn had to endure. The villainous role the media forced her to play, the compulsions that boiled over to violence. A film released in 1955 could not talk about these things. Evelyn's story is the story of the first It Girl in the Gilded Age, America's first supermodel. This is a story of obsession. This is a story of murder. This is the story of Evelyn Nesbitt. Evelyn was born around 1885. Her father was an attorney and her mother was a homemaker. Evelyn had a close relationship with her father who encouraged her curiosity and self-confidence. She also had a brother, Howard, who was two years younger than her. The family lived in Pittsburgh. When Evelyn was 10 years old, her father suddenly died at the age of 40, leaving her family penniless. Everything they owned was auctioned off. The sheriff came to their home and nailed an eviction notice on their front door. The death was sudden and this family was not prepared. Mrs. Nesbitt would cry into the night saying, what is to become of us? Evelyn would sleep with a pillow over her head to escape the nightly crying. Mrs. Nesbitt had heard of the Christian-like nature of the Thaw family. She had heard about the charity they had shown to others and she knew her family needed it, but she was never granted an audience. William Thaw was a coal and railroad baron. He would be considered one of the 100 wealthy Americans during the time of his life. He married and had five children, but one child stood out. Harry Kendall Thaw was born in 1871. As a child, he suffered from bouts of insomnia and severe temper tantrums. He had a morbid personality and would throw household items at his servants to amuse himself. Throughout his childhood, he was called unintelligent and a troublemaker. Eventually, he used his father's name to buy his way into Harvard. Thaw joked that he studied poker while at Harvard. He got into mischief immediately. He lit $100 bills to show off his wealth. He would drink heavily and attend illegal cockfights. He chased after a taxi driver with the shotgun because he believed that he was cheated out of 10 cents. Thaw would earn an expulsion from Harvard. When Harry Thaw was 22 years old, his father died, leaving him with $2 million. His mother also decided to give him an allowance of $8,000 a month. This was an extravagant amount for the time, when the working man made $500 a year. With seemingly unlimited finances and energy reserves to match, Harry Kendall Thaw would soon unleash himself onto the world. Still in Pittsburgh, eventually, Mrs. Nesbitt got a job at the boarding house where she and her two children could also live. She was too shy to gather the rent from the tenants, usually businessmen. She would make her young daughter collect rent. The men would pay, commenting on Evelyn's beauty. This pattern of sending off Evelyn to make money based on her looks would become a staple in the Nesbitt household. Eventually, Mrs. Nesbitt failed in the boarding house venture. Mrs. Nesbitt, Evelyn, and young Howard all got jobs at a department store. On her lunch break, Evelyn was stopped in the street by a woman. The woman claimed she was completely struck by Evelyn's beauty. This woman was an artist and asked Evelyn to sit as a model so she could paint her. Mrs. Nesbitt agreed only when she heard that this artist was a woman. After loving Evelyn as a model, this artist introduced her to other artists and photographers. When she realized she could make more money posing than at a department store, she begged her mother to sit full time. In the year 1900, the Nesbitt family moved to New York City, sharing a back room in Manhattan. Evelyn was now 15. With letters of introduction from the Pittsburgh artist, her modeling career took off. She appeared on the cover of leading magazines of the day like Vanity Fair and Cosmopolitan. She was also on posters for large companies like Coca-Cola. As she got more and more work, her mother attempted to be her agent, but was too unsophisticated, indecisive, and incompetent. 
Eventually, Charles Dana Gibson, one of the country's most renowned artists of the era, used Nesbitt as a model for one of his best known works. Titled, Woman, The Eternal Question, it features Evelyn in her profile with her luxuriant hair forming the shape of a question mark. Freud said the eternal question is, what does a woman want? In the photo, Evelyn's hair is half up and half down. Girls of the day would wear their hair down. When they reached womanhood, they would begin to wear it up. Evelyn lived in both worlds. Meanwhile, Harry Thaw was up to no good. He began a tour of Europe, keeping his mother's lawyers busy. He was known to brutalize prostitutes and those of the working class. Rumor had it he had a jeweled encrusted whip and brought handcuffs with him. In an infamous incident, Thaw was in a hotel room alone. He placed coins in plain sight and hid. Unable to resist the temptation, a bellboy takes a few of the coins. Thaw pounced on the boy. He dragged him to the tub, ripping at his clothes and beating him with the riding crop. He made him confess to his crime over and over again. Mother Thaw's lawyers got to work and they were able to buy out the bellboy with $5,000. Harry didn't mind though, he had plenty of his monthly allowance left. During his tear through Europe, he developed a penchant for cocaine and morphine. This would develop into a lifelong drug addiction. Evelyn Nesbitt became one of the very first supermodels of the Gilded Age. She was able to begin supporting her family on her own wages, but the long day sitting would still take a toll on young Evelyn. She would be told to be silent, an artist once saying, pretty girls don't need to speak. She was then approached by a theater director. This interested Evelyn. A chance to perform in plays seemed worlds better than sitting for hours on end. She brought the idea to her mother. Mrs. Nesbitt was at first very much opposed to her joining the theater world. Evelyn not modeling worried Mrs. Nesbitt. She would say, dollars counted horribly. Mrs. Nesbitt would learn that many of the chorus girls would go on to marry millionaires and socialites. She allowed her daughter to audition. She won the role and began appearing in musicals. She began to gain publicity for her performances, being discussed in gossip columns and theatrical periodicals of the day. Got a two-page spread in the New York Herald. Her beauty was often remarked upon, but her acting skills were largely ignored. She soon got the attention of one man in particular, his name was Stanford White. Stanford White was a prominent architect who was a partner in an architecture firm that was one of the most popular and prolific in the city. He designed the second Madison Square Garden, the New York Herald Building, and the Madison Square Presbyterian Church. He designed and decorated Fifth Avenue mansions for the Astors, the Vanderbilts, and other high society families. He even designed the Washington Square Arc, which is still there to this day. He was an impressive man and an important historical figure. Many in New York knew who Stanford White was, and so did Harry Kendall Thaw. After returning from Europe, Thaw wanted to join high society of the city, but he was barred from entry to many of these clubs, his reputation preceding him. He had a short admittance to the Union League Club of New York, but he was soon kicked out when he rode a horse up the stairs and into the club's entrance. Thaw had noticed White and saw how similar they were. He wanted to be friends with White, but White had no interest. White was already a part of high society. White was a member of all these clubs and White did not support Thaw. Through his drug-addled brain and his narcissism, Thaw began to believe that White was the one behind him being kicked out of all these clubs. In another incident, a showgirl took revenge on Thaw for publicly humiliating her previously. She convinced all the other girls who were supposed to go to his party to instead go to White's party. When Thaw was girlless and had heard that they were all with Sanford White, he didn't even contemplate. It could have been because of his own actions. No, it was all Stanford White's doing and his paranoia grew greater. In reality, Thaw had very complicated feelings for White. He wanted to be what White was. He wanted to be a part of high society and to be respected. What was so different about these two men? They both had money, they both enjoyed the same lifestyles, and they were both sexual deviants. 
except that white could hide it much better. White loved going to the theater for its music, pageantry, and its girls. He had a specific taste and he knew how to pick them. He was known throughout New York for his sexual desires, but his fame and status always shielded his name. Here I quote the white family historian Susanna Lassard. The process of seduction was a major feature of Stanford's white obsession with sex and it was an inoxorable kind of seduction which moved into the lives of very young women, sometimes barely pubescent girls in fragile social and financial situations. Girls who would be unlikely to resist his power and his money and his considerable charm who would feel that they had little choice but to let him take over their lives. There are indications that Stanford would sometimes adopt the role of a paternal benefactor and then would take advantage of the trust and gratitude that had been built. And in Evelyn Nesbitt, he found his next girl. He had another chorus girl make the introduction. White was 30 years older than Evelyn. Though polite at the time, she would later describe his size as appalling and said that he was terribly old. Still, she knew he was a man of great import and when she was invited to go to his apartment, she agreed. When Evelyn and the chorus girl first arrived, they saw the FAO Shorts toy shop. Evelyn was mesmerized, staring through the window. Evelyn wanted to look at and play with the toys. It had been so long for her to just play, but her friend dragged her away and into a dark alley. Where on earth are we going? asked Evelyn. Nowhere on earth, dearie, her friend replied. They walked upon a door and opened it. Now, they were in a beautiful red room, vibrant. The juxtaposition from the dirty alley to this marvelous red room was shocking. A dazzling display of food awaited them. So did Stanford White and another man. The two girls were both handed a glass of champagne. Evelyn drank the glass, but White refused to give her another. They dined and conversed. She went upstairs with everyone and into another room. This room had a high ceiling and was completely green. In the middle, attached to the ceiling was a red velvet swing. Evelyn marveled at it. The last time she sat in a swing, she was being pushed by her father. All of the guests gathered around and insisted that Evelyn should sit in the swing. Hanging on the opposite side was a Japanese paper parasol. They told her the gang was to see if she could kick it as she swung. She sat and was being pushed by White. Her first few attempts were misses, but she began to reach and shred the parasol. The guests cheered her on and Evelyn was having the time of her life. She would never forget this moment, smiling, sitting on the swing. White began to spend more and more time with Evelyn, but not just with her, with her family as well. He eventually became their benefactor, moving the Nesbitt family into a furnished suite at the Wellington Hotel. The apartment was beautiful, especially Evelyn's room with a matching part that reminds of the red velvet swing room, a playful gesture. He got young Howard into a prestigious military academy. White thought that Evelyn was perfect, except for her teeth. Her teeth were good, but not as perfect as he'd like. He sent her to the dentist to satisfy a purely aesthetic urge. Evelyn became what White would call his protege. He gained the trust of Mrs. Nesbitt. He then worked on her and convinced her to take a vacation to her home in Pennsylvania. Mrs. Nesbitt left the city and leaves Evelyn in the care of White. White, while out and about with Evelyn, runs into a business partner. When White introduces Evelyn and says that her mother left her in White's care, the man's only response was, my God, before excusing himself. Later, White invites Evelyn to what she believed would be a dinner party at Madison Square Tower. But when she arrives, she is the only one there. White just says, isn't it too bad that all the others have turned us down? In the past, White really controlled Evelyn's amount of champagne, but this time he forces more and more on her. He takes her upstairs to a room with tapestries, antiques, and mirrors. He then opens a secret door and reveals a room with only a four canopy bed surrounded by mirrors. Evelyn does not remember what happened next. She awakes naked. She looks over at a burly, naked White. She looks up at the wall and sees herself staring back. She screams. She said, 
I went into the room a virgin, but did not come out as one. Stanford White tells Evelyn, a girl must never talk. After this, Evelyn loses herself for a while, not putting in the effort for her performances and hardly engaging in conversation. But White comes calling again, and she goes. They become lovers for a time. For Evelyn, it was a decently happy time. In her naivete, Evelyn thinks that maybe White would leave his wife for her. For her 17th birthday, White filled his apartment with roses covered in sugar to make it look like snow. He also gave her many gifts. She calls him Stanny Claus. They did not know it at the time, but they were being watched. Evelyn discovers a black book of White's. In it is a list of other young women that White has been spending time with. She is jealous and disgusted at the same time. Their relationship begins to fade as White moves on to other women. A new patron at the theater appears, a Mr. Munro. He follows the same pattern as White does, having one of the chorus girls introduce them. He showers Evelyn with gifts and money. Thinking he had won her over and with great eccentricity, he reveals that he is not this Mr. Monroe, but actually Harry Kendall Thaw of Pittsburgh. Evelyn has almost no reaction to this. She doesn't know who the Thaws are, but it was obvious from the gifts and the money that this man was wealthy. Still, Evelyn sent the gifts back. It is unclear if Thaw chose Evelyn because of her relationship with White, but White became distant with Evelyn. She wasn't seeing him as much, and she started spending more time with Harry Thaw. Now, in 1903, Evelyn developed appendicitis and had to undergo an emergency surgery. Thaw inserted himself into the situation, ensuring that Evelyn would receive the best care available. The stress of the surgery caused Evelyn's hair to fall out, forced her to don a wig. After the surgery, Thaw suggests that they go on holiday together to Europe. Thaw convinced Evelyn and Mrs. Nesbitt and they would vacation together. The trip was not recuperative for Evelyn. Thaw had a whirlwind itinerary that exhausted everyone but himself. Evelyn, already physically weak from the surgery, began to mentally break down and was arguing non-stop with her mother, who was also exhausted. They argued because Mrs. Nesbitt was spending Evelyn's money on clothes for herself. Eventually, Mrs. Nesbitt had enough and left, leaving Evelyn and Thaw alone in Paris. He presented the idea that Evelyn should become his wife. She refused. Throughout their relationship, Thaw keeps dropping hints that female virginity is extremely important to him. Even though Thaw keeps pressing this proposal, Evelyn could not, in good conscience, accept without revealing what had transpired with White. What followed next was a marathon, a confession of the night she spent with White. Thaw excruciatingly extracted every detail from Evelyn. Throughout the night, Evelyn was tearful and hysterical, while Thaw was agitated, weeping, and gratified by her responses. Evelyn was moved by this reaction. Someone she confided with understood her. Thaw ended up blaming Mrs. Nesbitt, calling her an unfit parent. Evelyn defended her, saying that though her mother was naive and unwitting, she had tried to look out for her. And it was Evelyn who rebelled against her mother's caution and put herself in that situation. Thaw is the only one that Evelyn had been able to confide in and he sympathized with her. It was a relief to Evelyn. Then, Thaw went out of his way to take Evelyn to the site of where Joan of Arc was born, a famous virgin. He made more comments about the benefits of virginity and left a telling inscription in the visitor's book. She would not have been a virgin if Stanford White had been around. Thaw then took Evelyn to a large castle in Austria. He put the servant's quarters at the far end of the castle. Evelyn was uncomfortable to be alone with Thaw. She takes off her wig as to not excite him, but this did not help. With wild, dilated eyes, Thaw went into her quarters and locked them both in the room. He began yelling at her and beating her with a whip. He tore at her clothes and pulled at her hair. He said things about penance for her sinful behavior. His eyes still dilated, obviously high on drugs. Thaw began screaming in Evelyn's face. Did you really believe what White had told you? That all the girls do the things that you have done? 
No, there are lots of decent girls in this world, like my mother and two sisters. This went on for some time. Afterwards, he pretended like nothing had happened and was in an upbeat mood. They returned to Paris where Evelyn saw one of her friends and told them what had happened. They admitted that Thal had acted strange in their company too, that he had a dark side, a drug addiction. She escaped with her friends back to New York. Evelyn would encounter White again, but he was dismissive. He had his eye on a new girl. Evelyn was angry. He took away something from her. And if it was common knowledge, no respectable man would take her hand in marriage. Also, he had to have known what Thaw was capable of, and he still allowed her to go with him. She realized that White cared very little about her. During this time, Mrs. Nesbitt had remarried to someone else and had less and less time to spend with her daughter. Howard had been at school for some time. Evelyn was alone and isolated. She was losing her mother and had lost a disturbing father figure in White. She feared she would go back to the poverty that she once lived in. Evelyn also knew that if anyone else found out what had happened between her and White, she could be ejected from the life that she had enjoyed. Thaw was persistent with Evelyn, saying that what had happened at the castle would never happen again. He blamed White for everything that had happened. He sent an entire floral shop, made many apologies, And when she wouldn't see him, he sent others to apologize on his behalf. This went on for two years. Wanting to secure her lifestyle, she relented. They were married in 1905. Evelyn wore a black dress. Evelyn would gain another mother figure, Mama Thaw. Mama Thaw was controlling of Harry, who did everything she said. The newlyweds move in with Mama Thaw in Pittsburgh. Mama Thaw forced her religious views onto Evelyn. Evelyn became part of a puritanical-like social group, completely sterile and devoid of life. The rampant materialism of the Thaws begins to eat away at Evelyn. What she thought would be a life of travel and entertainment after marriage quickly disappeared. Mama Thaw made sure Evelyn knew that she would never perform or act again, that they would all forget that she ever participated in such actions. She became the proverbial bird in a gilded cage. Harry Thaw became even more obsessed with Stanford White. When he wasn't listening to his mother's commands, he was putting all of his energy into exposing White as an immoral man. He hires men to follow White. Randomly, Thaw would burst into Evelyn's room at night and make her go through the whole thing with White over and over again, reliving her abuse night after night. She realized that the only reason he married her was to relive this over and over again. He sent her to the dentist to get the dental work that White had gotten her undone. He became paranoid, thinking people were following him, that White had hired gangsters to come after him. Harry Kendall Thaw bought a gun. Already, Evelyn needed to escape. Thaw promised Evelyn that he would take her to Europe and that it would be a cleansing affair, that everything would change afterwards. She had something to look forward to. The couple came to New York in June 1906, soon to leave on their voyage. It was a hot day. Thaw was busy, finishing up last minute details. He surprised Evelyn with tickets to a musical. They went out to dinner. Thaw had his back toward the entrance. He did not notice that White had come into the restaurant, but Evelyn did. She did not say anything to Thaw. Evelyn thought if they could just get through this night without a scene, the trip to Europe could change her fortunes. They went to the musical. It was still hot, but Thaw would not remove the overcoat he wore over his tuxedo. The musical had already started when White came in, taking a seat at the table that was reserved for him. This agitated Thaw greatly. Evelyn tries to get Thaw to leave with her, to just stay in tonight and they could cross the ocean to Europe in the morning. Thaw agrees. They get up to leave. She is talking to him as they are walking to the elevator, and she is so relieved. Then she realizes that he is not with her. She turns to look and sees him walking towards White. Thaw approached White, then turned around, unable to face him. He did this several times. 
White had no idea. The finale started. The song called I Could Love a Million Girls was being performed. Thaw finally mustered the courage to approach White, took out his pistol, and shot three times, killing Stanford White instantly. He then stood there, holding the gun over his head. People were unsure if this was part of the performance or not, and did not react right away. Then Thaw shouts. There is debate on what he said, but it was either, I did it because he ruined my life, or I did it because he ruined my wife. He then walks back to Evelyn, who is in complete shock, and sits down. When the theater goers realize what had just happened, there is chaos. Thaw gives up his gun to the police with a smile and calmly walks away with them. A shocked Evelyn says, My God, Harry, what have you done? And he replies, I have saved you, and I have saved the young girls of New York. Afterwards, Evelyn went to a friend's house and quickly entered a catatonic-like state. The press machine began and focused on Evelyn. They talked to anybody and everybody that had a passing interaction with any of the three involved. But most of all, they remarked on her beauty. The show where the murder happened was a huge hit. Not because people wanted to see the show, but people wanted to be where the murder happened. Thomas Edison rushed the story into the Nickelodeons trying to make a profit off the murder. What would be called the crime of the century would spur the trial of the century. As the trial began, the defense wanted to use an insanity defense, but Mother Thal did not allow it, fearing her son and the family would become stigmatized by it. Instead, they compromised and went with a temporary insanity. Mother Thal had known of her son's mental illness, and her life's work had been to conceal it and keep her family's reputation intact. Fearing her son's past would be scrutinized, she spent a fortune on doctors to corroborate that this was an isolated incident. In Evelyn's words, Harry was a madman, but they will prove it nicely. A quote from the defense in court. Ah, gentlemen, if you desire a name for this species of insanity, let me suggest it. Call it Dementia Americana. That is the species of insanity which makes every American man believe his home to be sacred. That is the species of insanity which makes him believe the honor of his daughter is sacred. That is the species of insanity which makes him believe the honor of his wife is sacred. That is the species of insanity which makes him believe that whosoever invades his home, that whosoever stains the virtue of this threshold, has violated the highest of human laws and must appeal to the mercy of God, if mercy there be for him anywhere in the universe. Then Mama Thaw set her eyes onto Evelyn. Evelyn did not have a choice. Mama Thaw had control over Evelyn's finances, put a roof over her head, and food in her belly. Even more, she made Evelyn feel guilty and said that she was the only one who could save Harry from the electric chair. Evelyn worked with the defense. Mrs. Nesbitt worked with the prosecution. They said they would charge her for prostituting Evelyn to White. Howard, who had come to regard White as a father figure, blamed Evelyn for everything. Again, Evelyn was alone. Evelyn testified in court. It was a replay like the nights she spent with Harry, but this would be the last time she confessed what had happened. This time there was no sympathetic voice. She was at fault. Even though he was a man 30 years her senior, she was blamed. Evelyn was then cross-examined, where she was painted as if she was asking for it. A sensual photo of her was released. Her intentions were questioned. President Teddy Roosevelt tried to suppress the trial testimony because it was so shocking. He said the full disgusting particulars were preventing people from concentrating at work. In total, there were two trials. The first ended in a deadlock. The second, he was found not guilty for reason of insanity. He was sentenced to involuntary commitment for life in the Matawan State Hospital for the Criminally Insane in Beacon, New York. Evelyn finally received the money she had been promised for testifying and going along with Thaw's defense. $25,000. Since the death of her father, she had listened to others and put herself in precarious situations because of money and stability. This time, she rejects the money. She gave it all away.
Two years after Harry Kendall Fall was sentenced, Evelyn had a son. Russell William Fall was born in 1910. Evelyn maintained that her son was a product of a conjugal visit with Thaw. Thaw denied paternity throughout his life. She claimed that anyone who had seen the boy believed that Thaw was his father by the resemblance alone. But, as Evelyn would say, a working girl could not fight the Thaw millions. In 1915, Evelyn, at the age of 30, would officially divorce Thaw and soon remarry. She married Jack Clifford, a dancer, and the two shared a stage act. They were happy for some time, but the marriage would not last. She could never escape the image of a lethal beauty. Her husband just became Mr. Evelyn Nesbitt. He would soon leave her. Evelyn would work at a tea room and do clothes performances at a burlesque show. She wrote two autobiographies. Eventually, Evelyn would earn $10,000 to be a consultant on the 1955 film The Girl in the Red Velvet Swing, a highly fictionalized version of what had happened. She worked as a teacher teaching ceramics and sculpting in Los Angeles. She died in a nursing home on January 17, 1967 at the age of 82. Evelyn once said, Stanny White was killed, but my fate was worse. I lived. Evelyn's life was a tragic one. She was the victim, but she never got to play that role. She was used by everyone around her. She could never escape her beauty, and she could never escape her infamy. But she was just a person. Sometimes it is easy to forget that. I will leave you with the woman herself. Take it away, Evelyn. I now take pleasure in introducing this evening the star of Bill Gray's Review, Mr. Evelyn Nesbitt. Box in my flat because I'm 